I um, have the great honor of being the uh, board chair for Teach for America here in New Orleans and uh, really excited to welcome you all to this event this evening, which is an opportunity to really create, I think, a unique um, and in-depth conversation about what it would take to move our public education system to one where one day every single child in our city has the opportunity to achieve a, an excellent education. That's been something we've been trying We've been building toward a Teach for America for, believe it or not, the last 30 years. I'm embarrassed to say that I've been a part of Teach for America for 28 of those 30 years. It's been a long time back. <laughs> That's, That's how I met my lovely wife over there. And uh, we were both core members from 1992 to 94 and, and have stayed involved in education her much more than me. Uh, ever since, because Teach for America's mission is one that really, I think, grabs hold of you and is one that really kind of propels you forward throughout your entire life. Um, for the last 30 years, we've been here in New Orleans. Um, I've been lucky enough to be on the board since 2005, I think, and worked with many excellent uh, executive directors. Tonight, um, we'll have Joy Okoro on the stage with us, who is our new uh, ED here, and we're very excited to have Joy here. I think Joy's going to bring a lot of uh, renewed and reinvigorated passion to the job, and, and from my experience working with Joy so far, she's just been great, and we're very lucky to have her leading uh, TFA here in New Orleans. So, we've also, I've also been fortunate enough to work with some great other folks on the board, and I know we have uh, Billy and Jane Sizer here, I saw Leslie Jacobs here, um, we've had a, a number of, of just great leaders on that board, and we couldn't have done it without you guys. Billy and Jane have been on the board since probably 30 years, right? You guys go back to the beginning as well, um, and they're a couple years younger than I am. <laughs> so, so anyway, moving along, first, uh, let me also, while I'm up here, thank my former employer, Entergy, for hosting tonight. And I saw Patty Riddle Riddlebarger here, Patty's over there. Um, so special thanks to Entergy. They've been a really long-standing and just a staunch supporter of everything we've tried to accomplish here in New Orleans for, for many years. So thank you, Patty, and of course to, to Entergy. So without further ado, let me, let me uh, introduce our moderator tonight, who's somebody who probably does, needs no real introduction. Um, but Walter Isaacson is with, is with us here tonight, along with Joy Okoro and Elisa Villanueva-Beard, who is our um, TFA National ED. And Walter is, as many of you probably know, he's currently a professor of history here at Tulane. He's also an advisory uh, partner at Perella Weinberg, which is a financial services firm in New York. Prior to that, Walter was CEO of the Aspen Institute. He also has been chairman of CNN, and if that's not enough, editor of Time Magazine. And he also served from 2000, 2000, 2005 to seven on the Louisiana Recovery Authority, which of course helped us get back after Katrina. And uh, his most important distinction though is he was uh, former board chair of our national organization, Teach for America, and he remains chair emeritus uh, of Teach for America. So without any further ado, let me introduce Walter Isaacson. Hey, understand about Joe is when he said he's been part of Teach for America for 28 years. He was a third grader and had a poor man. <laughs> That's how he did it. Um, well, Joy, come on out. Am I supposed to, uh, am I supposed to make this into a... We've already been introduced. And it's great to be here. I'm just going to say a few words to set the stage here. I mean, both to welcome you to the celebration and also to talk about why we're going to have to double down. That's a phrase that Joy just used when we were talking earlier. But we want to make it a tough conversation about the real need to double down here. You know, we have to have a real conversation about education, but it's also a real uh, conversation about this city, about the multiple solutions we need in the long game in this city, and the role that TFA is going to play in that. Many years ago, when I was chair of the board of Teach for America, and since Wendy's not here and 
you're not going to report back to Wendy. I'll explain what being chair of the Board of Teach for America <laughs> is like with Wendy. Have you ever seen Prince Philip? You know, that guy, that old dude who walks three steps behind Queen Elizabeth and carries the purse? That's what it was like being chair of Wendy. You have to walk three steps behind her and carry her purse. But one day we did something interesting, which was after the storm. The only hotel that was open was the Sheridan. In the big ballroom of the Sheridan on Canal Street, there were 245 members of the Corps of Teach for America that had been here. And about four days into the school year, the storm had hit. So a few weeks later, the waters recede, the earth begins to heal. We're in the Sheridan, in that ballroom, you all know. And um, Wendy says to him, look, the schools aren't open. They're not going to be open until January. So you can leave New Orleans if you want. And we'll send you to the Delta country, we'll send you to Baton Rouge, we'll send you to Houston, you know, other places where you get paid because there's nobody to pay you now. Or you can stay in New Orleans and take a bit of a stipend. Uh, you won't get your full paycheck, but you can help rebuild the school system. I get a bit choked up when I remember it. We went right to the first class, I'm staying. And every single core member stayed. And not only the 245 core members stayed, the next year, there were close to 500 core members. At one point, Wendy pulled me aside. You were a Phoenix person, and it was like people coming in from Phoenix. We have to stop the fact that they all want to go to New Orleans. But not only did they go to New Orleans and rebuild the schools, they helped create a new type of school system. And I think 80% of the students in New Orleans are currently being touched by somebody who is or was a core member. So that's deeply important to the rebuild of our city. Mm -hmm. And I know with uh, Joe and his wife, who does KIPP Academy, whether it's KIPP Academy, Teach for America, New Schools New Orleans, or uh, Collegiate, all of them, even Ben Markovitz, who started Collegiate, I said, you weren't a core member. He said, yeah, but I was in love with one, so I had to move <laughs> to New Orleans and we got married. So I'm really honored to share the night. You know, through the experience of this, our core members of Teach for America now uh, consist of nearly 60,000, you told me, Elisa? Across the country, yeah. Across 60, the country, people have been core members. members. And Elisa and I just agreed backstage. Early on, when I was first the chair of Teach for America, a job I got, by the way, as a bit of journalistic malpractice, because I was at Time Magazine, and I wrote a story called 40 Under 40, The Great Young Leaders of America, and Wendy Kopp was one. And uh, next week she called up and said, will you join our board? And I said, sure. <laughs> that was in the days before journalistic ethics and conflict, <laughs> conflicts of interest. But anyway, we said even back then that the strength of Teach for America would be twofold. It'd be like having a two-pronged army. It would be the core members in the classroom, but it would also be the alumni. And when you look at KIPP, I mean, you can tell me down here, you know, so many of the KIPP people were Teach for America. If you look around the country, the whole notion that no kid should be left behind and that every kid deserves a decent shot is infused into our system uh, by Teach for America core members. So let me welcome both of you and start with Joy and say, uh, what drew you into education? How long you've been doing this? I've been with Teach for America for about 11 years, and so from being a teacher in the classroom to joining staff at Teach for America, holding a multitude of roles. Um, and I feel very privileged to serve as the executive director for Teach for America in New Orleans. But way before that, my story dates back to my parents. Um, I am the product of two immigrants. Um, my father came to this country from Nigeria, my mother from the small island of St. Kitts in the West Indies. Um, and they came to this country for educational pursuits. So, being a first generation American, only two things mattered in my household, school <laughs> um, and culture. My parents wanted to make sure that I always knew and remembered who I was. Um, probably the most interesting thing then, but not that interesting now given the work that I do, um, is that I never went to school in the same place that I lived. Um, I didn't always know what that meant, um, but it was challenging growing up, you know? Um, my fellow classmates never really looked like me. They never ate the same food. They didn't eat the same food as I did. They didn't really speak the same way. Where was this? This was in New York. Um, so I grew up in Queens, New York. And, um, uh, but what I also know is that those very schools and the neighborhoods that I didn't grow up in prepared me, prepared me to be sitting on this stage right now. 
I learned and I achieved. Um, and so I found Teach for America, headed into my senior year at Temple University in Philadelphia, PA. Um, and I just knew that it was a way. Like growing up, I knew that there was this bridge between education and opportunity. Um, and I knew that it wasn't right. Whatever that relationship was, wasn't always right. But I got, it, it was right for me because I went to school in different places. And so once I found Teach for America, I knew it was my way to figure out how to make that relationship work across our country because it wasn't primarily for kids that looked like me. Um, you so said that you were interested in social justice from way back, and that's part of the mission unstated of Teach for America. What percentage of the kids in this town are from disadvantaged backgrounds? In New Orleans? Yeah, in schools in New Orleans that we serve. 90 plus. Mm -hmm. 90 plus. I mean, you know, this audience is from New Orleans, so we know here we kind of speak about the world in terms of like pre-Katrina days and post-Katrina days. Um, but pre-Katrina, the vast majority of this city um, were students that were underserved. I think the demographics of our city have changed a bit since the storm and um, folks making homes other places after being displaced from the storm. But it still remains true that the vast majority of students that are in public schools in our city are underserved. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me, uh, Lisa, about your journey from the border of Texas. Yeah, that's where my story starts. Um, everyone should know the geography of Texas. If you don't, you go all the way south. Um, you hit uh, the Mexican border, and you kick up about 10 miles, and that's where I'm from. Uh, my mom immigrated from Mexico at the age of 17 with a formal eighth grade education, and just like you, she figured out quickly, uh, like your parents, that education was the pathway to opportunity. So much so that she said, the single most important decision I made was marry your dad, because I decided if I got married, I was gonna marry a man with a college degree, which is quite literally how she chose my dad, who's first generation <laughs> college graduate. Did he know that? <laughs> They're still together 45 okay. years later. He turned out great. Um, but I'll just say education was very important in my house. I end up in the Midwest for college at DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, a world away from South Texas. And I was sure that the hardest part of my transition would be that um, just culturally I was like a fish out of water um, going from South Texas to, to Greencastle, Indiana. And at the time, DePaul was 3% Latino, 5% black. And um, then school started, the classes started, and I realized that I was underprepared for the rigors of college. Now, the reason that should be shocking is because I was an A-plus student. I mean, I was the kid that quite literally did everything right. I had the list, and I did it. I was student body president. I was the leading scorer of my, you know, I was an athlete that was leading scorer of my district for basketball. Um, everyone said, you are ready. And suddenly, I was, I was failing. And I thought, I've been lied to my entire life. And I actually started to believe that maybe I didn't belong there. Um, but I called my mom a few months in and said, Mom, I don't think I'm going to make it. And, and I mean, I'm that kid that's like up at 4 a.m. on Saturdays and Sundays studying. I'm super disciplined, and it wasn't producing. And she said, well, I'm sorry that it's so hard for you, but you're not welcome home until you complete your degree from DePaul University. So, you know, you should stop complaining and go, go work harder. Um, and I, I did terribly my first semester. I did better my second. And then I did really well. I was like on the dean's list. I was like, I found myself. And I had caught up. But then I was really upset because I thought, how is this possible that I did everything right and then I made it? Most kids don't even make it. It's, it's, it's just so challenging and it's, it's just quite unfair. Um, but that's what drew me to Teach for America because I heard a core member talking about teaching in Phoenix. And I was mesmerized by her story and her passion and her determination to ensure that kids get the education they deserve. And I thought, I want to be part of a team of people that believes that much in kids and is that determined to quite literally create a different reality. So I joined the Corps in 1998. Are you worried that that sense of social justice and elevated mission, people are attacking it now and we have to preserve it at Teach for America? Um, I think that there is a lot of cynicism around what is possible. And I think that we live in a country that is highly polarized and there is lots of folks who are you know, the, how we organize ourselves, who we're around, um, really causes us to look inward, the, just the tribalism of just how we, who and we're around. And how do you around. keep Teach for America above that? I mean, honestly, it's like focusing on the mission, like what we believe and what we know can be true and trying to transcend all the divides. You all, we have played right into it. Like the thing I'm most worried about, Walter, is that 
we are so fractured. Like there is no education coalition that used to come together across lines of difference, across political spectrums and say, this is an American issue. This is truly an American issue. We need to be able to reach every kitchen table in our country to care about this and say, what are the things that we just got to double down on for kids? And at the moment, we're deeply fractured. There's no real leadership in public institutions saying, you know, we got to, as you said, double down. Um, we're talking about climate change, real issues. We're talking about income inequality, real issues. You know, racial disparities, all these things that deeply matter. But what undergirds all of this is education. Like, how do you take any climate change? You, those are massive systemic issues, but you cannot get anywhere unless you're really thinking about education. And so um, we're trying to just get this to the forefront. But we actually, I mean, we need a revival in our efforts, truly, to, to move yeah. this thing forward, broadly speaking. So that revival means doubling down. I mean, how clear are you that we're making great progress in New Orleans? And why do you believe in doubling down? Yeah. So. We'll answer that question. One, one thing I want to add to what Elise is sharing, though, is like, particularly locally, because that's the context that I understand the most and how we're talking about equity, issues of diversity, inclusion, I'm seeing those things happen very separately, right? I'm, I'm hearing folks have a conversation around what it means to be diverse, you know, uh, who's leading, who's sitting on this board, who's sitting on that board. And then there's a conversation that's happening over here around education. What does achievement look like? What does rigor look like? What does excellence look like? And what I'd like to see moving forward is those two things come together because I believe that achievement is equity. And in the city, I just think that, not even just in the city, I think across the country, like um, there's almost like a popular sexy nature around like diversity and equity as though that's a thing that we should be aspiring toward in itself. <laughs> And I think excellent teachers inside of classrooms, quality materials in front of kids is how we advance equity. Um, to the progress question, um, I think that there are some people who are unsure in this moment in time about whether or not we're making progress in New Orleans. I personally believe that I am very clear that progress has been made. Um, and frankly, that clarity is what provides me the optimism and hope that I have for like how we're gonna continue to move forward. I mean, when I first came here in 2008, I was teaching pre-GED mathematics to 15-year-olds. So what that meant was if you were in eighth grade and you didn't pass the eighth grade leap, you were essentially stuck in the middle school setting. And by the time you became 15, 16, or 17, you were in what was called the options program. Your option was to get a GED. So we took 15-year-olds. I had a personal belief that we could still turn it around. We could figure it out if you were still 15 years old. Um, but we weren't, we said, you're gonna be in a pre-GED mathematics class. Not only does that program not exist anymore, but you, you wouldn't see that in our system today. And that's not to be confused with the fact that we have a ton of work to do. Um, if we were to say, are our schools excellent and meet this holistic bar? Certainly that's not the case, but I am very sure because I've seen with my own eyes how hard people work and the difference between what was when I arrived here in 2008 and what is today, let alone what existed before my arrival uh, in New Orleans before the storms, I'm sure. 2008 is when the reforms really kick in. Tell me about the difference we have in New Orleans to other places and how that either helps or hurts your mission. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a policy play. Like we, we, we leveraged policy to create a system that in my opinion redefined the floor um, in New Orleans. And we said that there was le legislation put in place that essentially would close schools that were not performing and meeting the bar for kids, and we would open, also open new ones that were working. And so I think we leveraged the policy landscape to create the conditions. Those conditions also look like pushing decisions closest to kids. So that means a deep belief in principles and their ability to understand what it takes to drive change in the classroom. And at that time, I believe that there was incentive around innovation, incentive around what are the materials that you're putting in front of kids, what curriculum is being used, hiring and firing decisions, all these sort of bureaucratic things that were part of our system in the past that slowed progress. Um, I, ironically, I think that we're sort of back there. Like in this audience, it's no real secret that as a city, we're plateauing as it relates to um, achievement. I'm not as concerned by that or that doesn't necessarily wane my optimism because I think anything that's growing and progressing as fast as we were as a city, I mean, 
fastest urban um, uh, district in the country for many, many, many years, at some point, you know, that hits a wall, right? I think it's just incumbent upon us to ensure that we're, we don't take this moment in time and it results in an erasure and a backslide from all of the progress that we've made. And so I know we'll talk about this in a second, but I think we need to focus on principals and I think we need to focus on teachers. And then I also think that we need to focus on protecting the policy conditions that created the environment that we have today. Um, and the policy conditions just can't say, we created the first, charter dish, the first full charter market in our country and that's just it. The same kind of incentive to innovate that existed when we first do this, I mean, it was palpable when I first arrived here in 2008, needs to exist again. And what, what do you think is pushing the backsliding? I mean, are you worried about sort of policy changes? Um, I think a lot can be undone. Uh, so as things change in the political environment, I think um, shifts in leadership can, can certainly... You mean that we could things. just slide back to having less autonomy for the school leaders and teachers? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that that's possible. And how do we fight that? I think that we actually believe in what we created. So for example, um, it is true that in our system, because we are completely decentralized, that in certain arenas, we lose economies of scale. Um, and so I'm thinking a ton about some of our, our single site schools that are, aren't afforded the same benefits as our schools that are supported by a district. That is an, um, an unintended but real consequence of the system that we built. I think we just have to figure out how to pay attention to that. But the answer to that isn't to build centralized infrastructure because when I think about what drove the change was the autonomy, was the deep belief in what a principal can do um, if they are given the decisions and the room to maneuver. And so I am, I am concerned about that. I am concerned about us moving closer to um, centralized solutions that, that could solve problems. And I think we just need to be thinking way more creatively about how to maintain the, the autonomy in our city. Uh, Alisa, has um, progress stagnated nationally as well? Um, well, it depends who you ask and what you're looking at. So um, <laughs> if you look at the NAEP, you know, the nation's report card, folks would say, you know, from the 70s to about 2012, you saw real progress. So the point of, has there been real progress? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, and so that has stagnated. But if you ask, like, why is that stagnating? I mean, there, it's just complicated. You know, NAEP hasn't adjusted to Common Core, but the 46 states are using Common Core, whether they call it that or not. Online testing, so NAEP went from, like, you know, paper to online. And so how, what's the impact of that? So it's hard to make sense of it. The biggest concern for me is what I was talking about earlier, which is there is a fractured group of folks who are not coming together and actually fighting each other. And I think it's like... I think it's the most um, tragic thing because we there there is enough. It's enough hard to do the work that we do that we have to continue to have the highest of expectations for our children. We have to meet their unmet needs, you know. And and you know the people I know that are in the work are committed to rigorous learning. They're like getting feedback, trying to do it better and and improve. And we have to continue to do that. But I'm trying to figure out like how do we come together and ask to what end? So. The progress has been incredible. When I started in 1998, I mean, we were still asking, can kids do this? Because there weren't enough schools that were showing us in our communities. Of course, kids of color and kids in low-income communities can do just as well as anyone. But that was literally the conversation in the 1990s. That's no longer the conversation. But like, how do you then scale and codify all that we've learned, mm -hmm. um, be real about the th mistakes we made, take pride in the progress that has been made, and figure out where do we go next? And how do we have a community of, of learning and rigor and you know, welcome divergent perspectives? Because we don't know the answer, you know, Walter. We know some of the things that matter, like autonomy, like you're talking about. We know that really matters. And you know, we've got to get present to the 21st century global demands of our children. I mean, in 25 years, what do our kids need to be prepared for? Are they, are they going to be ready to thrive and lead and inherit the world that we are leave, living for them? Are we preparing them with those knowledge and skills and capabilities that they need? And 
Um, and so, and it's just time to really step back and be cleared eyed. And people that want to say, well, you know, what does that mean? I'm not sure, you know, I'm, well, I have ideas on what it means, but like right now we're kids that go to college, 60% have to take remedial courses. 60% are taking remedial courses. They don't get credit for that. It's costing families $1.5 billion. And if you take one remedial course, you're 74% more likely to drop out of college. It's not quite, like, we got to get to the next level. We got to come together. We have to have a vision. We've got to be about our children and, and, and live in the hope because it's 30 years ago, people would have said, well, TFA, it's naive hope. Y'all are just a bunch of optimists and idealists. And that was true. But now we actually have evidence that shows we weren't just idealists. Like, actually, it's true and it can be different. And now it's up to us to have the courage and the will to, to do that. Yeah. What inequities still exist in the New Orleans school system that you would love to take on? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that comes to mind for me is this, this choice point that, that exists in our context around rigor and excellence um, and culture and tradition. Right, mm -hmm. that if you, if you want to love New Orleans the same way that my parents taught me to love where I'm from, that, that means that we can't figure out how to do those two things at the same exact time, and that if you are gonna go to a school that is preparing you to attend any university that you want or take on any job that you want, that in order to acquire that in this context, you have to uh, let go of or relinquish the very things that make you a New Orleanian or someone that was raised here. And I think that if we were fully living into our aspirations of equity, we would figure out how to bridge that better. Um, I also think that the point that I raised earlier around there being dissonance between um, equity and excellence, like in my head that those words are synonymous. Um, and, and as we hold students to a bar of excellence that we are realizing our aspirations for equity. I mean, I imagine a New Orleans where every family is opting into our public school system because it's just that good. And, and why wouldn't you, right? And that's just still not where we are. We have a city where if you can afford to, since we don't do vouchers anymore, uh, send your, your child to a school um, that is private, like one of the many parochial schools uh, in our city, that is a choice that folks are still making. And I don't really take issue with that choice in and of itself because lots of those schools come with rich histories. But I, what I want to be true is that folks are choosing those schools simply because I went there, right? But that's what folks say a lot. Like, my kid is going to X school because what I went there. But what's not being said out loud is that my kid is going to that school because the public school, which is free, um, and what most people would probably prefer is not actually adequate for my kid. And so I'd like us to sort of like unmask the reality of what, what plays out in our city. And I think that the way to do that is to build a public school system that all parents would opt into across lines of race, across lines of socioeconomic status. Do you think people in New Orleans, parents in New Orleans, are fully appreciative and aware of the progress that's been made since Katrina and the school reform movement and the rebuild of the schools by TFA and others? I think it varies. Like, I think some parents know, right? Like, so when I think about when there used to be Committee of the Whole meetings, uh, you know, with Bessie, there would be many parents that would get up and stand and defend to the ground the school that their kids were going to. I mean, I'm thinking about, I actually vividly remember a parent getting on a mic to talk about Kip East Community Primary and say, this is the best thing that has ever happened to me, my child, and, and this city. And then I think that there is a cadre of parents who, who truly don't know. I mean, earlier today, I, I spent time with Gary Briggs, he's a Teacher of America alum. I think he's, he's out in the audience somewhere. He's with, hey, Gary. Um, he's with Ed Navigator, and he was sharing with us earlier. Yeah. You know, I, I talk to parents all the time in my role, and they, I ask them, how am I, how am I, how's your kid doing? And they're like, great, obviously. And then Gary looks at the, the report, and it's a complete opposite narrative. And so I don't think that we're doing enough to actually um, help parents understand the reality, and I think that as a city, we are overtaken by whatever the popular narrative is about anything. Um, and I think Teach for America 
um, you know, once upon a time was synonymous with reform and sort of like got caught up in that. And then also the understanding of the quality of schools. Like I think folks sort of like know what they hear, but I think it's on us to make sure parents understand the reality of what's happening inside of the school building. And I think that that's progress. Imagine what would happen if parents knew and were fully activated on this. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's one of the issues we have here and I think nationally as well. But here in New Orleans, when people talk about the reforms may be, you know, we may have backsliding, we may get them reversed, there may be more centralized control, et cetera, is that it's hard to get parents to push back against the various interests that are pushing against the reform movement. Mm -hmm. And it's been hard to capture that narrative that enough parents are willing to go to the microphone and say, this is the best thing that ever happened to my family. I think we haven't always um, seen the assets that our families are. Like our ass the, the greatest asset is our, our students and our families and ensuring that they are armed with the information and are able to have agency in the whole thing and use their power. Um, and, and that's like, I think, where the big, I'm like the sleeping giant is the family and they should actually be shaping the whole thing because it's for them and they want what's best for their kids and they want what's yeah. best for their families. And so um, I think that's a big part of, our, of the future. I think as educators, honestly, we, we miss the information age. <laughs> like, I think folks work extremely hard. They get up at six o'clock in the morning, they're leaving schools at seven o'clock at night and they're truly putting their heads down to get the work done. But how information gets shared is so quickly over the internet. You share messages and, and that's how information is shared. So I truly think as an education reform movement, both locally and nationally, we, we miss the boat on messaging. I think for 10 years, people were putting their heads down intently, working to build a system that works for more kids. And we never lifted our heads up for more than two minutes to actually tell the story about what we were doing. Um, but there were lots and lots of folks telling the story about what we weren't doing or the changes. Like, so are you going to change that now in New Orleans? I am going to change that. Oh. So <laughs> I am going to change that. So, uh, so Teach for America um, is is really not new to this. We've been around for 30 years, like here in Teach for America. I think we've been an important stabilizing force of talent in the city. And I think as part of our 30th anniversary, which is coming up next year, we'll be celebrating 30 years of impact. I think it's just a perfect moment in time to tell the story like I'm looking out into this audience I'm seeing alums that I've seen in the classroom that are now leaders in their classroom leading systems etc and I think we just need to tell that so I'm excited to launch a campaign alongside our 30th anniversary to tell the story of who we've been but more importantly where we're headed is that gonna be a national movement too yeah, so I mean, the big opportunity that we have here, and we were talking a little bit about this, is we're really stepping back and, um, you know, we're 20 years into this and we're asking ourselves, what does the next 30 years of this mm -hmm. look like? And really taking stock of all that we've done. And for those of you that um, might not remember, you know, the 28 years that we've chunked them out, the first decade was, you know, proof of concept, will this idea actually work? And after a decade, we realized, oh, there was something going on here. And then the next 15 years was growing to scale. The demand for TFA was growing, um, and we realized that scale would matter given how big the problem was, and so we set out to grow. We went from a network of 5,000 core members in 2000, and by 2015, we were a network of 50,000. And you were our chairman during this time where we grew like literally 18% compound annual growth rate for 13 years straight. And we were able to prove that our teachers were good during this time. And that's when the alumni movement really came to be. We have 200 um, elected officials. We have um, over 200 social entrepreneurs. If you follow the Forbes 30 under 30, literally 52 of our alums have been named in that in the last five years. We have seven state chiefs of education. We have 14,000 alums who are teachers, um, over 30 state teachers of the year, um, a finalist for National Teacher of the Year, 1,200 principals. So our folks are just everywhere. And so we are taking that as our greatest asset and asking um, just the fundamental questions, like how are we going to ensure that we meet the promise to students and families that their kids will thrive and lead in the world that they are inheriting for themselves, for all of us, and for future generations? Um, how do we recruit, support, and de develop and support the leaders we need to make systemic change over the next 30 years? 
Um, how do we activate this alumni base? I mean, 53,000, um, ignite it, activate it to really be able to learn from each other, organize, you know, be able to innovate together and have collective leadership. And then how do we build the next version of TFA for agility? Um, and really be able to live in the in the very dynamic times that we're living in. And so that's the process we are undertaking And so now. as you look at that 30-year forward yeah. strategy, what give me a few things where you say this is next. Yeah, well, I don't know the answers yet because we literally kicked off this process in January. But um, what we do know is that we need to make sure that we're capturing the hearts and minds of this generation. And let's just be real about what's happening with Gen, Gen Z on campuses. When you go to these campuses and you ask them, what are the most important issues happening in America? Education is like number 10, or not, not even the top 10 list often. Um, and, and I think that is very scary. So you ask them, why, what do you think about education? And, and they just see a, a, um, a movement that is fractured. They are watching these teacher strikes. They're like, why would anyone possibly want to go teach and, and work at this. Like, it, is it, it's not even working. All we hear is that it's not working, right. and it doesn't actually matter. We need to take on income inequality and the workforce, and you're like, well, how do you do that? What's the plan for that? Um, and so we've got to be able to really figure out how do we adjust for these interests, and this generation behaves very differently. They, are, they have lots of debt, and so they're looking for fi financial um, stability. They are folks who um, are very risk averse. And um, you know, I don't know if you've read Coddling of the American Mind or anyone has, but I encourage everyone to read it. Um, but you know, just how we're raising our kids who you know, are, are feel more fragile or just scared to take these big risks um, and want to really see clear career paths and are a little bit discouraged by the conversation. And so um, that's a big thing on my mind, is like, what is it gonna take and what's the value proposition we need to offer on why this is the single most important thing that they can do and commit yeah. to as we look forward. It makes me think of collective responsibility across our city to, to welcome talent. Like, I can tell you that core members come to the city extremely optimistic about what they're gonna do. Like, as hard as it was to recruit them, because all of that is really challenging per Elisa's point on campus. And then they arrive and they are, they are unsure of their impact. They come right away and they hear 10 different narratives and it leaves them confused about whether or not they are on the right side of history. They are unsure about whether or not their presence is helping the system or hurting the system. And given what we know to be true about about how vulnerable our talent landscape is. Like we have not figured out recruitment and that is not a New Orleans problem, that is a national problem. But we have 900 teachers that are gonna leave next year in New Orleans, right? That's right. How are you gonna fill it? I mean, I think that there, Teacher America will continue to be the stabilizing force as it can be, but when With I talk about, help. Yeah. yes, but when I think about the collective responsibility in this room, I think that they are more inclined to stay if they're clear on their role, if they feel welcome if they feel sure that we are working together toward a common mission and aren't fractured in the way that Elisa is describing. And when, and when you arrive here, it, it can feel fractured. And if you're lucky, you sort of like find your community, you find your lane, you find your space. Um, but I think that we all have to claim responsibility over education at all levels in a way that I think we have in the past. And for all the issues of our time, whether it's our current political landscape, all the other challenges, there's very good reason why folks are concerned about other issues. But I, I absolutely believe that education is at its fundamental, is at the core. And you were just talking about using the 30th, I guess, in New Orleans yeah. as a nice pivot point. Are there ways that we should do, like we used to do in the old days, with the, this is why I teach for America sort of rallies and discussions, <laughs> where you can take next year and try to get this entire city to fully understand not only the role of teach for America and the impact and each kid, but the role each parent has had, the role yeah. each kid has had, the people have gone through it, and just have them on stage in various places yeah. to say, here's what we're doing, let's be proud of it. Yeah, I mean, I'm excited about that campaign to be in partnership with a ton of people. Like, I see um, just our school partners, parents, um, other organizations, because Teacher America is clearly not the only player or folks that are trying to do this, but I think we must come together as a city for a centralized narrative. Specific to Teach for America, though, I think we have to have a good story to tell. And uh, so we need everybody in this room 
to sign on to the fact that next year we're going to get the narrative right, we're get the, the good story right. we tell, because it's the story of everybody in this room, but every kid who's been touched by it. We all know the kids who've gone through, the teachers who've done it. That's right. And we have to find a way to make sure everybody we know in the community becomes part of a movement to say, here's the narrative. We just want right. to make sure we all know it. That's right. And we have to be keeping our promises. So as much as I'm concerned about telling the story of who we've been and where we, we're headed, programmatically, I deeply care about our teachers being good. I am obsessed. Um, like, right now, it's, it's, we're unsure. Like, Lots of our teachers are great. Like we know every national study that we've done, like our teachers are on par with every other teacher coming out of any traditional teacher program. But I think that it is incumbent upon us, given our aspirations for equity, to be better than that. And so I am obsessed with ensuring that first year teachers and second year teachers are excellent. And that what the current perception is that if you are a novice teacher in our system, I think that the current stat is half of the teachers in Orleans Parish are between zero and three years. Mm. So they're novice. That's a, that's a problem. So I don't think that our entire system actually needs to be flooded with novice teachers, but I think that we have to be so careful to not tell a misleading story that novice teachers don't have a role to play like in the ecosystem and that I feel like I can figure out how to ensure that if that is our current reality, as best as possible, those zero to three teachers are not going to be a burden on the system as best I can. Bravo. I want to thank Intergy. Is there somebody from Intergy here? They've been the title sponsor. Yes. Stand up, yes. wave, <laughs> say hi. Who yes. is it? I can't tell. That's Caddy. Caddy. Yeah, thank yeah. you all for what you do. Thank and now so let much. me uh, open, uh, open it up for some questions right here. Yeah. Yeah. The whole notion of blended learning and technology, and of course Sal, as you probably know, started it because Newman was missing a math teacher and Nadia, his niece, needed tutoring. So it started, Khan Academy started in New Orleans. Both start locally, then nationally. What do we do with the blended education weaving in new technologies into the classroom? Yeah, we, I mean, we see a lot of our core members and alumni integrating things like Khan Academy. It gets a little iffy when you are talking about, you know, the access to online and how, how good that access is. In our rural communities, we're seeing massive disparities there. I was just at um, a rural convening last week, and they're saying this is one of the biggest disparities. So they don't even get access to the incredible potential of knowledge. Um, and then what I watch in the urban centers is um, sometimes not having access to great um, you know, computers or technology, but also the need to differentiate and how do you incorporate it. But I think it's an awesome asset, and I think we're going to learn more as people are successfully integrating that into their practice. I'm going to interject real quickly because I'm on the Khan Academy board, but having been on the Teach for America board, I stole a mantra that will be the Khan Academy program for next year, which is called the Every Kid Program, yeah. mm -hmm. which is that there is a great disparity. You talk about Sal being able to teach you calculus at home, but surprisingly, that was supposed to narrow the opportunity gap, yeah. but it's widened it. And so Khan Academy is going to go deeply into trying to provide in-flesh personnel as well as uh, resources. That's great. On the line that every kid in America deserves a chance. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great. I just think I think there needs to be room for it in our system. But I think I just think that we we shouldn't be in search of any one particular uh, solution because no one thing works for all kids. And so what I love and what I'm optimistic about in our ecosystem is that 
our, the structure of our system allows for that. And so I think that we just have to be welcome to a variety of learning and be okay as system and school leaders if your school isn't the school for a particular child because you have faith and collaboration that in the rest of the system, there is a place for them. So I think it's great. Um, I just think it's part of a, of a, of a broader and to solution. to reemphasize what Joy said of no silver bullet. Yeah. It was about five, 10 years ago, everybody saying that this flipped classroom was going yes, to change everything. One thing, yeah. In many, many ways, it hasn't. And we realize the importance of the actual real teacher in the classroom. And even Sal understands the relationships. Yeah, yeah. somebody. You were saying relationships. Okay, relationships, like relationships. Yeah. Matter. So, uh, yeah, I think that we're finding that that movement towards MOOCs. We're now having to recalibrate because the teacher dub, means a lot. One of the biggest lessons beyond like there's no singular solution and there never will be is um, one of the most important um, points of transformation, like to, in order to move a kid's achievement and outcomes, it starts with relationships. Um, we did a study at TFA that studied our good teachers um, that stayed good their second year and our good teachers that became great in their second year. And we all had our theories on, well, it's their better planners, they use data better, they whatever, reflect better. No, it was like relationships, that they literally love their kids as if they were their own, that they'd want them playing with their own kids because that is the point of transformation that leads to then unleashing everything else. And so mm -hmm. that will always be an important part of our system no matter what happens with AI and technology and everything else. There's a woman there and then the gentleman here, <laughs> and I probably should. Yeah. Hi, Rio Grande Valley core member. <laughs> Kate Swin. here. There's two of us. <laughs> I know, I saw her earlier. Two RGB in the house. Um, so uh, I run an organization here in New Orleans called Youth Force NOLA, uh, and we are a citywide collaborative focused on making sure our graduates and that a high school diploma in New Orleans represents more than just academic skills, but sort of really an understanding, a strong, flexible five-year plan, soft skills, technical skills, sort of real readiness to pursue post-secondary. And, and a big part of effort here in New Orleans has been what we call sort of hearts and minds work in terms of helping our educator partners overcome the like, no, 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 all our kids are going to college. Um, as you know, sort of, which, which we know harkens back to the sort of big bad old school VOTEC. So we know we need to overcome the, the inequitable history of VOTEC, and we know and we believe that career readiness is good for all kids. So I'm curious to understand nationally how is Teach for America thinking about the college for all paradox that we ourselves have created, and I always, I sort of always acknowledge with my team and our partners that, you know, my hook as a first grade teacher in the Valley and as a fifth grade teacher in Austin was, you know, when my kids asked me, why do we need to low know this? I said, because you're gonna go to college, like you need this for college, right? So, so I know I, I perpetuated some of the challenges in this. I'm curious how, as a movement, we're gonna tackle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we deeply believe that every child should have agency to have a choice. And so what that means, to me at least, is that we believe every kid should have the choice to go to college or to start a career. So we say at college and career ready, not or. Um, and, and that is because we just think every kid should be able to be able to make that choice for themselves. So as long as they're having that choice, then I, we, I think that is, that is the objective of what we're trying to do. And, um, and totally agree that you know, we got to shift and make sure kids are finding their passion, figuring out what they need for themselves. Um, but as long as there's real agency, that's how we have pivoted our work. And I think there's real reform to be done on all the career readiness stuff and excited to see that various folks are taking that on. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, so my name is Juan Serrano. I've uh, been teaching for seven years now from the Wallens, local HBCU grad. Um, I'm actually now transitioning out of the classroom. And part of that uh, my work to that end is really to preserve my own mental health mm. um, because we know teacher burnout is so real. Um, one thing that I acknowledge about New Orleans, I think it's, it's great in terms of our charter network or charter context for the autonomy that that creates in our leadership. But I wonder, um, you know, thinking from an equity perspective, thinking about teachers, what, you know, we don't have a union out here. Um, for our teachers, and so that, to some degree, relinquishes our own power to preserve our mental state to be the best versions of ourselves for kids. So I'm wondering what uh, opportunities there are to make sure that teachers have power to, one, sustain the work that they do, um, but two, to be their full and complete selves. Mm -hmm. 
goodness, I mean, that's, that's a real question and a hard question. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind in response to that question is, as it relates to Teach for America, is um, activating our alumni base and um, relying on civic engagement. Like, I, I, I completely agree. Like, my personal stance is I'm not pro-union, I'm not anti-union. Like, I think I, when I was a teacher, I was a union member. Um, and so I think that that's, challenge, that's challenging. So I, I, don't, I don't know if I think that the solution is to figure out how teachers unionize here, but I do think that there's a major role for us to play in activating our civic engagement, um, electing, electing officials that, um, that result in it being so hard um, or, or that don't result in the fact that like the MFP and the potential teacher pay that's on the table right now uh, didn't have to be 10 years in the making. Because um, when I think about that, those are real people. Those, aren't, like, those decisions aren't being made somewhere in a factory. It's, it's actual people, legislatures, that are making those decisions. And 10 years have gone by, and we haven't reconsidered the MFP. We haven't reconsidered teacher pay. And so when I think about the opportunity of, of continuing to focus on bringing in teachers and supporting um, their efficacy inside of the classroom, I also think it's about activating our alumni base because here in New Orleans, we're at scale, right? There are 1,100 of us. And so I think that there's also a role for us to play um, in the civic engagement environment to ensure that the conditions around teachers are, are better and stronger because they aren't right now which is no secret as to why folks are like leaving the profession in droves. Um, and so you're right, we don't have something like the union pr to protect that, but we do have um, our ability to vote for, for legislatures and individuals that are actually going to advance policies that support the conditions that teachers need to thrive. Good answer. Mm -hmm. It's there. Why don't we do there, there, and there, and then we're gonna wrap it up, so. Okay. No more hands. Okay. <laughs> I have a follow up to that young man's yeah. concern but that's not really my comment, but I was wondering if we wanted to throw Rhonda under the bus and let her ask how Kip would address some concerns like that. But I'll, get her, I'll let her think about that. But I also <laughs> want to- Wait. <laughs> I didn't point I, that, Rhonda. I, What's a, your question? Okay. <laughs> um, Wait. My real question is, you're talking about community responsibility. How do we get people here in New Orleans, whether they're Orleans Parish or Jefferson Parish, to realize that just because I don't have children in a public school doesn't mean that it's not important to our city, to our community, to have a solid, well-educated population. All right, do you want Joy or Louisa? Yeah, I mean, I think what Joy was talking about, I, I mean, I think it starts with us understanding, which I don't, I don't know how to get people to understand, um, that all of these decisions will impact all of us and are impacting us now, but are gonna impact our children and their grandchildren. Um, and I think part of the big challenge we have in our country is that there's a lack of proximity. Like we're not in relationship with each other across lines of difference, across different socioeconomic lines, you know, lines of race and class. And so, so I keep thinking like, how do we provide the context in which that is, that is powerfully happening, and we've learned that TFA, it's one of the most powerful parts of our model is that we really get in relationship with human beings and you fall in love and you get empathy and you, and you, you realize we're all interconnected and this is all on all of us to solve together. Um, but I, I, very practically, I would say the civic engagement of this, like, you know, do pe are people understanding who they're choosing to create policy and the conditions in which we are making decisions, I think, is one of the most important and very concrete things that people can do to get involved um, and just really starting to raise the conversation with each other in our networks and seeing that as real responsibility that we all have um, in this city. I mean, when I think about how change happens in New Orleans, everything is word of mouth, right? It's just like who you know and, how, and, and where you are and what event that you're going to. And I do feel like once upon a time, education was kitchen table conversation. Like it was in 2008 and I think that we have to get back there. Like when folks are convening friends, when folks are having dinner parties 
at houses, like the intentionality around raising education as a topic of concern is something that I think we all have to take responsibility for because as the reforms were new, as they were happening, it was in the news all the time, it was all in our face, but we're not seeing as many messages as we used to about the real work of teachers inside of classrooms, the real challenges that principals are navigating. And so because you're in this room and you have access to this kind of information, that we turn education into kitchen table talk again, because that's how change happens in New Orleans. And I think that that's a good thing. Did you want to make a comment there? No. Yeah. <laughs> right. You're good. Uh, this, uh, I think it was, uh, I'll let you go next, and then we'll end with the gentleman on the aisle. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a 97 Baltimore Corps member. I feel like you need to represent. I don't think I've seen a Baltimore person here. Um, but uh, So you got two. <laughs> um, and um, I returned to the city in 2008. I'm raising my three children here. They go to public schools. The last one will go when she's five. Um, I run a CMO, right? Like, I'm all in. And I think one of the wonderful things about New Orleans is it's small enough that those of us in this room can really make an impact. And, and, and thank you for inspiring me to remind myself that that's true. Um, but I've been thinking a little bit about narrative. It's on my mind a lot as the head of a CMO and worried a little bit about the narrative, particularly when everyone just nods and say, we plateaued. And those of us who do the work in school over the last 10 years realize, have you seen that social studies test? Have you seen that science? Mm -hmm. Like That's the right. standards have gotten better higher, and higher right. and they should be because we were not asking enough of any of our children, That's let alone right. our disadvantaged and, and, and black and brown children. Um, in, in Louisiana. And so I'm so proud to be in a state where I think we are asking enough of our kids now. And now our students are showing that they can, they can do that. But my question is around parents. And I find that my first job is to make sure my students and my parents are happy in my schools and they're, and they're doing well. And all my numbers say that. But it's very difficult to get parents to come out for the policy things that I find super interesting. And I know that um, other school leaders are thinking about all the time, but they're not that sexy, right? Mm -hmm. Like this idea about let the, you know, let power stay at the school level, you know, return to OPSB does not mean centralization. And my question is, how do you rally parents around things that are actually not as relevant to them when that is what we need to continue to innovate? And so I'm just interested yeah, I'm in that narrative let part. let Joy address that, because you keep sort of tantalizing us with the fact that we could use next year to rally kids and parents around the concept. So what are the ideas we can do to help do that next year? Yeah. So. The first thing that comes to mind is the work of our alum. So I think it's right. Like if you're in a school building, you should be focusing on keeping your students and your parents happy and, and doing that in that lane. Then I think about, I mentioned Gary uh, earlier, organizations about, uh, like Ed Navigator that is particularly parent focused, uniquely positioned to engage parents in a way that like frankly, I don't think we need to be adding to the backs of schools. Now of course, schools have a responsibility to and are accountable to parents, so I'm not, I'm not trying to get rid of that. But I imagine us partnering with organizations that have literally parents right in front of them because of the nature of that work. And so lots of those sorts of efforts are led by our alums. And so when I'm thinking about opportunities headed into this 30th anniversary campaign, figuring out how we're just playing the role of connector and playing the role of convener um, and figuring out who has, the, who has parents as an audience and starting there. And then once we have that, if we feel like that's not carved out enough, then we need to figure out what does it take for parents to be engaged. And I think that that could be the work of some of our alumni because I agree with you that needing to get parents to the table is real work that needs to happen. But I, I don't think that that needs to be on the back of a school. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to leverage, again, our power in numbers to activate our base to solve that particular issue. Because what I think a challenge is in our alumni base is like our alums aren't necessarily pointed at any one, two, three, four, even five things. But if we decided as a base of alumni that like parent engagement in the civic arena is, is a thing of many things, then that is a message that I can be espousing to our alumni. But we're sort of like not aligned right now on on one or five things, and so I'm hopeful that we can continue engaging so that in the 30th anniversary, we have a three-point plan. We're clear on what, as an alum base, we're gonna be taking on moving forward. Last so that question. That could be one of them. Yeah. Uh, good evening, my name is good Marcus evening. Wilson. I'm a fifth grade teacher here in New Orleans. Um, yeah. Hi, Mark. From New Orleans, my family is deeply rooted here, so my question is, um, 
because I love the city so much and anybody who knows New Orleans know that we love our city, how does Teach for America maintain or help maintain New Orleans' cultural identity while bringing in the influx of people who are not from New Orleans? Definitely. Yeah. I'll let you do it and then I'm gonna let Elisa do a call for action at the very end, so okay. go for it. Okay, that sounds good. So my first thought goes back to narrative, right? So. Um, it's important to know, a lot of folks still out in the, in, in the ethos think that Teach for America are um, white core members from the Northeast that are, don't know anything about anything south of Atlanta. You know, that's just like simply not the case anymore, right? And but so there's the, nothing wrong with There's nothing wrong with them. I mean, I'm from New York, I'm, I'm from the Northeast myself. But so, so some of it is also like narrative, like the feedback was received the feedback was acted on, and we were very intentional about diversifying in the, uh, the core to reflect the backgrounds of our students. Now, we also believe that it requires a broad and diverse coalition to do this work. So what I, what I will put into the universe is, Teach for America will never be an organization that like, only recruits locally, only recruits people that look like um, our students, and that's because we believe that this is a nationwide thing, that we need multiple people focused on this issue. But I think lots of other folks should do that and we should be partnering with them. Um, and then it's about introducing folks to the city. So something that we do very concretely when core members come here for induction, they, that's like their first time ever coming to the city. They spend two full days just immersed in the city. Um, I think some folks who are in the audience actually came and visited um, in induction with us. And, but knowing and understanding this city and it's a complexity is like not wrapped up in like a two day retreat, right? It's, it's about, well, that may be an intro, but it's about getting to know your kids, spending time with your families, attending a festival, going to a second line. And these are things that our core members do because they wanna love this place. But I think that um, the two way street that's necessary is that they feel welcome. And I think that, um, that's complicated here, right? Like the, the very thing that makes this city special is the very thing that also can make folks who aren't from here that deeply care about this place feel not connected or not engaged. And I think that it's just a struggle that we have to be in together. But Teach for America, is, Teach, Teach for America cares deeply about um, local context. Like we only exist to ensure that the public education system here in New Orleans serves the children of New Orleans. Not children in Connecticut, not children in California, but the children in New Orleans, and that requires a deep understanding of the historical context here. And I'm committed to ensuring that my core members understand, not only understand it, but experience it. And by the way, Marcus, thanks for what you do. Appreciate yes, thank it. thank you, Marcus. Joy, wrap it up for us. Um, I mean, Lisa, wrap it up for us. Joy <laughs> just Lisa did. Saying, yeah. You know, I, I, I was in D.C. a few weeks ago, and I got to um, visit Ingenuity Prep, and I got to see the whole school. And right when I walked in, I was, like, overwhelmed. It was, like, rigorous, and it was love, and it was incredibly supportive, and I got to talk to random kids. And I talked to this kid, Omari, third grade, and he, you know, I, I often ask, like, you know, what are you working on? Why does it matter? Do you have a goal for the year? Do you know what you want to do with your life? And this young man knew everything. He was on a mission, and he wanted to be an astronaut. Um, and you know, at the end of this, I'm like, I can't wait to watch you be an astronaut. He's like, well, you better believe that I'm going to be an astronaut. And I walked out of there so full, and I kept thinking, how many of our kids have that kind of aspiration and clarity of purpose and understanding? And every kid should have that, right? But then I started to ask myself, are we, are we believing that that is possible? Like every day that we wake up, what I hear a lot is all the reasons that that's not possible. I hear about the massive systemic barriers that are gonna face Amari as he grows up. And that, I'm not saying let's ignore that. I'm saying let's be present to that, but we have to land in the hope that we actually believe Omari can be an astronaut, he deserves to be an astronaut, mm -hmm. as any other kid. And we have to help our kids dream, and we have to, as yeah. adults, have the courage and the will to break down the barriers, to clear the way for our kids to be able to do just what they want to do. And I am worried that we are forgetting, like, we, that's what we believe, right? And there's so much, so many people that tell you the sky is not blue. And you're like, no, 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 the sky is blue. And we have to keep letting, wanting to get people to see the sky to be blue. And so my charge is that for us to, like, 
have the determination we had, I had, when I joined the Corps in 1998, where you were like, this can happen, and it is so complex, it is a systemic problem, I am very present to that. But we have to land in the hope and in the optimism that this can be solved, and our kids need that from us. Um, and not, if not us, I don't know who. And so I hope that we, we continue to figure out how do we reject false dichotomies, how do we start to have rigorous conversations that are dealing with root causes and real issues, and have a real vision for our city so that it's different in 20 years from now for, for all kids. And that is why all of us here support Teach for America. Well, I hope you all will really get deeply involved in continuing to help Teach for America nationally, but especially joy in helping it transform this community. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.